Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you in association with Match Bingo. Now, you might be wondering why I'm mentioning bingo and cricket in the same sentence, but the team at Match Bingo have created the world's first real-time sports bingo game. Every ball becomes like a bingo ball, so a six on the first ball of the over, a catch on the fourth ball or a quick single to keep the strike could all win you cash prizes with a minimum of £275 to be won across every IPL game. You can play along with the IPL every day this week and they're giving away free cards for the Lucknow Delhi game on Friday and the Punjab Rajasthan game on Saturday. We had a go in the office the other day and it is good fun. You can sign up via the link in the description or via the QR code if you're watching on YouTube and get your free card for the games this Friday and Saturday while checking out their other games. Every card purchased also goes some way in supporting the Stroke Association. Players must be 18 or over. Please play responsibly. The 2024 English summer has begun. Sam Cook has restated his England test credentials. Sam Northeast broke an all-time record at Lords, and there's good news about Joffre Archer's fitness. England's inform white ball opener Maya Bouchier joins the show and there's a bit of chat comparing Joss Butler and Virat Kohli's most recent IPL hundreds. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is Katia Whitney and Ben Gardner. Before we go to Mark Butcher, a reminder that we are under a month away from our next live show in London. Ben, it was it was good fun last time, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was good fun. Quite well, a lot of why did, my why, did, why did you have to think about that? Well, no, I was just, I was just trying to remember remember what happened and which, which bits were fun. But, you know, it, it was good. A lot, a lot of chat about my hair and now mm. it's much more normal for those of you watching on YouTube. So yeah. we're going to have to find something else to talk about. Yeah. I'm sure we'll manage. Well, it's uh, um, the Hank and Ginger Cafe next to Oval Tube Station on May the 9th. Uh, us three will all be there. Phil will be there. Butch will be there. And there'll also be a special guest who we will hope to announce next week. There's food. There's a bar. It's unrecorded. So you'll get to hear stuff that's a bit different to usual. You'll get to hear what we really think. Um, there's a Q&A session at the end, a quiz too, and all that for just 22 quid. Uh, yeah, the last one was great fun. So get involved. Tickets are selling quickly. Anyway, here's Butch on Sam Cook. But Sam Cook is a name that we've talked about for a while. And this year, there may be spots up for grabs in the England seam bowling department. We're used to him taking lots of wickets in the early bits of the English summer. But this week was probably on another level. A hat-trick in the first inning, six or 14 in the second. Taking wickets when very few other seamers in the country were doing well. Um, I guess, first of all, what's different from a bowler's perspective about performing with the Kookaburra ball? What extra challenges are there because he stands out as being one of the few teamers to have had success with it. I mean, accuracy is at a premium, really. That's that's kind of the, the first thing. And if you've got a lot of pace, which obviously Sam Cook does not, um, but accuracy and the ability to kind of to to hit the ball, hit the seam often. Obviously, high pace would be great, but no, not everybody has that. But that doesn't mean you can't be successful with a Kookaburra ball. Um, there's two guys whose names spring to mind. Um, Stuart Clark, New South Welsh, who was incredibly successful in the sort of post McGrath gillespie era. Um, and of course, our friend Vernon Philander, um, who both made the Kookaburra ball talk at sort of between 85 at the top end and 80 miles an hour at the low end, which is pretty much where, where Sam Cook sits. Um, I watched him actually... It, while I was out in, in South Africa on the SA20, he made his debut in, in the tournament um, at Joburg, at the Wanderers. And a lot of guys hadn't seen him before. And, and I sort of said, well, just watch this guy. He'll take, he should take the new ball. He took the new ball. He'll hit the seam on a, on a really good, really good length. And he'll make it do a little bit in, a little bit out, off the wicket, um, at a length where batters have you know, a difficulty in kind of um, deciphering what's going to happen next. Almost as though he doesn't know and neither do they. And lo and behold, he, he nicked off one in the first over, got another one in the second um, and kind of people were like, wow, okay. And at the wonders, he made it carried through the length. You know, it was all very pretty, beautiful bowling, but full length, nipping it a little bit out, a little bit in. Vern loved it because it reminded him of him. Uh, and that's what he does. Mm. Um, he's equally, obviously, 
clearly he, he likes bowling with the Duke as well, but um, but he's somebody that can make a, a kookaburra ball move. Um, and I think he's kind of been the sort of like the the ready-made replacement for for, for Jimmy Anderson for about five years now. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. been kind of hanging on in there, taking his wickets, um, you know, at a, at a good rate, regularly knocking people over um, for Essex. And has kind of had to bide his time while while the extraordinary James Anderson continued on and on and on, uh, and maybe now is the time for him to 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 get a go um, with an England shirt on. Mm. I mean, he you're right. He's been doing this for years. His record is absurd. He averages less than twenty across the entirety of his career. Essex have always been at the top end of Division One since Cook got into the Essex side. I mean, you mentioned yeah, it there. Yeah. Do, do, do you do you see Cook being a possible um, Test cricketer in the near future? Yeah, well, I've I've kind of been batting off um, uh, sort of Twitter uh, vandals um, over the last five or six years, saying when is Sam Cook going to get a go? And, and my answer was always, well, while Jimmy Anderson is there, there isn't really a spot for him. Um, but if Jam- Jimmy Anderson is no longer there, then he, you know, like for like, he he comes in, um, and he has he has that sort of skill. He doesn't swing the ball like like Jimmy Anderson, although he can. Um, he's much more um, sort of movement off the seam, off the wicket. Um, but he's no less accurate. Uh, and there's a similar, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy had the, uh, had the, um, the ability to, to crank it up at various points in his career to get up towards 90 miles an hour. I don't think Sam Cook has got that, but what he does have is unerring accuracy um, and the ability to move the ball, whether it be a Duke or a Cookaburra. Mm. I know you weren't um, the biggest fan of, of the use of the Cookaburra ball in England, but if, Weeks like this show that someone like Sam Cook, who people might pigeonhole as someone who uh, can only mm. really do well with the Duke's ball, etc., when it's cloudy. Um, <laughs> if if weeks like this show that bowlers like him actually do have the tools to be successful with it, is it is that possibly worth the the the, the, the change? I know the cricket wasn't always the most exciting, but no, you know no. English cricket has learned that Sam Cook has potentially got yeah, um, more, although, more tools although than we thought. I would argue that. If you'd been watching, you'd have realised that anyway. But um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, and also, I think that the the preponderance of of spin um, and its success in that first round is something that we might not have seen otherwise. Um, you know, Cam Steele taking it, Dan Lawrence for goodness sake taking taking wickets um, with his Ministry of Silly Walks action um, up at Old Trafford. <laughs> So um, it, it, it had it had its bonuses, but then you know I, I've always again I've always argued this that there are there are there are always there were plenty plenty of days and plenty of occasions over the last goodness knows how many years where in the early rounds of the county championship the Duke ball also couldn't take a wicket. Um, you know the idea that the ball itself is the reason why people take wickets, why people don't take wickets, why spinners bowl and why they don't bowl is nonsense. It's all it always has been. Um, <laughs> the pitches are the thing. It's always the pitch. Uh, we saw, you know, we saw records broken um, at Lords. Extraordinary amounts of runs scored. Six hundred and thirty played six hundred and fifty-five triple hundred for uh, for Sam Northeast. The pitch, the pitch was obviously incredibly flat, incredibly slow, incredibly flat, and would have been exactly the same had they been using the Duke as well. Um, you know that's that's my that's my my view, and I'm sticking to it. You you've always had days. And remember what was that Test match at Trent Bridge and the Ashes when uh, you know the the extraordinary finish at the end there, where no one, where the ball would barely carry through to the keeper. That was with a juke ball. We've we've had many many days where bowlers of any stripe, spin, pace, seam, swing, haven't been able to get anybody out with a juke ball. And it's not the ball; it's it's the pitch. Um, always. I still think we're looking in the wrong place, but if if this evidence um, serves to to push the case that Sam Cook is a very very good bowler indeed and has been for many many years, then I suppose it's a good thing. Mm. Uh, you mentioned a couple of spinners doing well in week one. Um, one of the most notable uh, moments of the first round of the championship was just the the naming of the Somerset team, even with Jack mm. Leach injured. Shoaib Bashir did not play for Somerset. Instead, they picked five right-arm seamers um, in a game where the opposition had Matt Parkinson, who bowled a lot, and in a game that Somerset themselves bowled a fair bit of Matt Renshaw's off-spin. Um, Baz McCollum said it would be mad if counties didn't pick Hartley and Bashir 
um, at the start of the summer, given how well they bowled in India. Mm. Um, what did you make of Bashir not being selected for Somerset? Um, it's just a, it's a lack of imagination, really, isn't it? It's kind of a, a an Englishness to its core. It's April, um, and so that therefore we need as many seamers and as many sort of seam bowling all round as we can possibly pack into a side. Um, they were wrong. I mean, you know, if if four seamers, if you think the ball the ball is going to do enough um, for the seam bowlers, then four is always enough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the fourth one shouldn't get much of a look in if it's going to go all over the place. And so if you have room in your side to 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 have a bit of variety, just in case things don't turn out exactly the way that you you plan it, which clearly they did, um, mm-hmm. then they had room to have picked Bashir and they didn't and, and they probably won't do it again. And your old mate Az Mahmood, he's he's leaving Surrey to to go to Pakistan. Um for, for Pakistan fans uh, who'll be listening to this, what what would they expect? Obviously they'll know Mahmood well from his playing days, but as a mm. as a figure what should Pakistan fans expect from Mahmood? Um, he is, he's, he's an absolute warrior, um, is Azza. He still, he still runs in and, and bowls full tilt. Now, I think he, he must be close to 50. Maybe not. No, actually, he's not as old as me. Um, but he's in his mid, mid-40s. mid He's still fit as a fiddle, still runs in and, and, and gives the keepers practice on, on middle practice, fizzing it through. I've um, got an enormous amount of knowledge in terms of um, in terms of seam and swing bowling, whether it be reverse or, or normal, um, and is a is the kind of is the kind of guy that you would absolutely love to have in your dressing room because he kind of mm. doesn't believe that there's any, anything uh, or such a thing as a lost cause, uh, and and is a much much smarter guy than I think people have ever given him credit for um, in in his coaching time in terms of the way the way that he reads the game. So. Surrey's loss will be very much Pakistan's gain, and it, and it's a, I think it's a really good pick for them. Really, really good one. I mean, just looking at his work at Surrey, individual bowlers have improved under his watch. You know, Jamie Overton gets a first England call up, um, sort of through reworking his run up, mm. uh, led by Mahmood's suggestions. Uh, Gus Atkinson sort of came from nowhere into the international reckoning, and Tom Laws is another one who's played for England Lions, whose development has soared under Mahmood. I guess my last question would be. Pakistan cricket is a very chaotic place at the moment. Um, is Azza the sort of guy who, who you'd um, trust to be a, a voice of calm and, and common sense in a, in a place that often isn't very calm or <laughs> often doesn't have a lot of common well, sense I, either? He, he, certainly, he certainly would be. I mean, he'd, he'd certainly um, have that that point of view and he'd certainly be somebody that players would be very keen to kind of, kind of have a have one-on-one chats with. Um, whether or not he, he holds the sort of the, the power to to be able to change um, the overall picture is is a different thing. But I think as a as a as an individual is incredibly good at, at, um, at understanding the bowling action for for a start, and he's also very very good at sort of getting and inspiring and getting into the heads of of the players that he's working with. Um, and that is the job that he's been asked to do, um, and he will do that incredibly well. Should they ask him to do anything higher up than that, then uh, then all bets are off. <laughs> well, it's an exciting time for Pakistan. Mohammed Amir is back. Nasim Shah, Shaheen Afridi. So seeing how they go with Mahmood at the helm will be fascinating. Um, well, that's it for this week. Cheers for your time, Butch. Catch you next time. Sam, hopefully a different Sam, asks, having been on the fringes of the England squad for a few years, do you finally see Sam Cook getting a call up this summer or because he doesn't bowl 85 miles per hour does that rule him out um ben 275 first class wickets at 19.48 what more does sam cook have to do and do you think not just should he get a go do you think he will this summer uh have we definitely checked the different sam (laughs) (laughs) it's a hell of a coincidence uh yeah i mean it's a phenomenal record and i am being convinced that he should get a go and I think there's a decent chance that he does because it feels like one, this is the summer for a bit of, you know, uh, not to underestimate uh, West Indies and Sri Lanka, especially, you know, they've Sri Lanka have had some very good results recently improving under Silverwood. West Indies have a very good bowling attack in particular. We saw that mm. in Australia, but England will also look at, you know, next summer, India tour, winter after that, it's Australia. They will think that if they haven't come out of the summer learning the things they need to learn, that'll be a bit of a missed opportunity. And Sam Cook is 
is one of those players. This isn't the first time he's done it with the Kookaburra ball. There was a game last summer where he took four for 40 odd, I think, against Lancashire. Um, and he's just, he was one of the players I spoke to when I did my the big piece in the wobble scene mm. last uh, summer. And you can just hear he's such like a uh, an intelligent bowler in the way he just thinks about how he just like holds his hand and his wrist and all those sorts of things. And that that really can set you apart when it comes to, like there are lots of things that can, prove to be a difference maker when it's not just super helpful conditions and he has some of those things even this week he did an interview with Crick Info talking mm. about um uh what it is that helps you with the kookaburra ball and he's talking about how with the jukes ball you can have bowl these these massive wobble seamers where the seam's going like in a really big way whereas with the kookaburra you need to make sure it's just like it's a bit more just subtle. That, that little bit yeah because you're also and you get a little bit less of a window as well to to make it work and I guess also the question is England will want to even more so in recent years, they've looked to have several bases covered in their attack. And I guess that has been one of the questions is how he fits in in a world without, well, with Broad and Anderson. And when it looked like Robinson was going to be that that third guy as well, if you needed a third guy like that, you're like, well, where do you get another sort of lowish 80s guy who is very skillful in? Uh, but now I guess Robinson's sort of stock has dropped a bit since that, at the start of that indie tour or even since this time last year. Um, and uh, Josh Tongue's still unfit. Yeah, Anderson's Broad's retired. Anderson, yeah. I mean, Anderson surely won't be playing all six tests, mm-hmm. even if they want to keep him around for this winter and beyond. So you think, yeah, you've just got to have have a look at him to see if that is it possible to to replicate what he's done. And I kind of like, but it's not as if you know, no bowl has ever been low eighties and had success in, mm-hmm. in Test cricket as Sam Cook is. Um, you know, you can get a bit carried away with this with this pace thing and and he is just a supremely skillful bowler and it's just an obscene first class record so yeah i think he should get a go mm. i think he i think he will get a go and i think he'll go okay mm. uh, katie what do you think i kind of think it's exactly what ben was saying really it's been so hard to stand out as a mid 80s low 80s pacer in a world in a landscape that broad and anderson have dominated so much for such a long time mm. because at most you're going to have three of those kinds of bowlers in your side in an english test summer and there's always been kind of someone ahead of him to do that role. Um, but now that it's a bit kind of more thin on the ground and there'll be more young paces coming through to the England side, especially in a almost developmental summer, England might view it. Um, there's definitely a way in which he does come in. Um, and to have someone so kind of skillful and knowledgeable about how to bowl different variations, it kind of makes sense to give him a run this summer with a view to kind of like embed him into the side more as like Anderson kind of plays less and less tests and and Robinson's stock as Ben says has fallen a bit so yeah I I guess he should make um he should be playing for England this summer and the more and more I think about it the more interesting that kind of England seam lineup is this summer Mm. um and how they rotate and how they manage that um and how they view it as a developmental summer or as um, or as something else, so it yeah, will be I mean, interesting. Could still be Anderson, wouldn't works exactly. Um, I, I think as much as pace, I think his height also has counted against him in the mm-hmm. past. I think there was that depth chart that England put on, um, not England put on Sky, but England staff members who are part of the sort of talent identification team put on Sky a couple of years ago, and they basically said with seam bowlers, you need to have generally uh, those who have success at test level. Um, Ha- are either really quick, move the ball loads, are really accurate, um, or have a high release point. Well, they need two of the four. You need that, to have two of the four, I think, and mm-hmm. and Cook um, obviously doesn't have pace, doesn't have height either. So he, so he he, he f- featured very well on the other two. But um, I thought when Butch was talking about him, that the comparison that I'd make is Philander. Mm-hmm. Fernan Philander was someone who was in the lower 80s, wasn't particularly tall. But that nagging length, I think you can sort of underestimate just how effective someone being that accurate with their length. And I know Robinson is taller than Cook and he uses his bounce quite quite well. But when Robinson's had success in Test cricket, I think a big part of that is just how accurate he is. Um, but th- there is also just a bowling intelligence thing. Like we, we've seen this with Robinson before on that Pakistan tour. There was th- There's ways that you can think and think out a batter and that can just come like, that's why I think that, you know, that ridiculous first class record should count for something because it mm. like... It's knowing, Division One as well. He's yeah, like he's only played in Division One. That that should count for something as well. Yeah, but it's it's kind of it's just knowing how to take wickets and in Division One wickets of of, of good players. Mm. That 
that just should count for something, you know, like, but mm. not just because it's, you know, a justice to the counting championship point of view, but because like that, that is also a metric, but it's one that won't come out sometimes in the data because, mm. you know, you can't see what, what plan someone has tried to pull off in the data sometimes, but it is still a, such a valuable tool that a bowler mm. has to have. You have to be able to, un- like, it's, I guess it's understanding conditions as well. And that's what we've seen from the Kookaburra this time is it's not just that he has the skills to bowl, with the kookaburra it's that he has been able to work out it's, it's the actual mm. working out bit that is encouraging yeah, as yeah. much as the fact that he was um able to take the wickets if you see what i mean yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. i think it'd be absolutely fascinating the sort of um race to, to be a, a seamer for the test i mean it's still three months to go yeah. until the squad's announced that's, that's let alone the first test match a lot more um, chat, and i think yeah. right now I reckon there are, there are there are at least ten seamers who I actually wouldn't be surprised if they play. Like I like the idea of Sam Cook playing, mm-hmm. but do I want to see him more than Josh Car- Tung? I don't know. Probably not. And you know, suddenly there are only two other spots in the team, so I think it's gonna be really difficult. But yeah, an amazing standout performance from him. He took four for fifty nine in the first innings. Um, that included a hat trick and six for fourteen in the second. As Essex were the only team in the country to win in what was generally um, when teams got on the park at least a high scoring round of games with the kookaburra ball there was a lot of rain there were complete washouts at durham and derbyshire not a single bowl ball bowled at either ground um and at lords it was a, it was a proper run fest where both glamorgan and middlesex hit 600 plus scores in their first innings ryan higgins scored a double hundred for middlesex but the headline from lords was that sam northeast hit the highest recorded first class score um, in a match at Laws, 335 not out. Two years ago, he hit a quadruple 100 for Glamorgan as well. Ben, he averages over 40 in first-class cricket. He's 34. He's never played for England. The England top seven has rarely been that settled over his career. Why has someone with that record not played for England? Yeah, I think there's there's quite a lot that goes into it. But also, I think there's, uh, there's probably two key things. One is that he is mainly bat at number four in the era of Joe Root. Uh, the other is that it's all very well to say someone averages this much over a period of time, mm. but you actually need to kind of go back and look when are the points when he could have been selected. And to be fair, there are a couple of times when he would have been in the conversation, I suppose, uh, going into the 2017-18 Ashes. He'd um, uh, he'd averaged 50 that summer. It's worth saying as well, a lot of his runs will come in, in Div 2, which might count against him a bit, but he'd averaged 50 that summer. There were There were mentions that he might be in the conversation, but England went with with James Vince instead, which is, I guess, not an unreasonable call. And he actually did a, did, did a right that winter. Yeah. Uh, and then at the end of the 2019 summer, England, they he'd had a good summer then in Div 1 for Hampshire. Um, that is probably the time he was he maybe closest, but England had just come to the end of an Ashes. Uh, there'd been a few guys who'd done decently in that Ashes, but also Ed Smith, the selection at the time, went for quite an extreme youth policy. They backed Zach Crawley at that point, which, you know, has paid off pretty well now uh but that was a, a long and also long it wasn't ago. quite like for like no sure sure right yes Caw- Cawley, although he debuted at six was brought in because he was doing well at the top of the order yeah but then you look at it and then Bearstow was dropped for that new zealand tour and then weirdly recalled having not done anything for the safka tour and you wonder if england wants to back up batter sam northeast i think but what was the third leading run score in division one that year that that would have been a time when he mm. could have got the chance but then that's just cricket sometimes. You'd, it was a, a, a marginal call that went against him. And then he had a couple of bad years. And now he's sort of mid-30s mm. playing in Division 2. And England don't call up those types of players. So it, it is unfortunate. But I also, um, and you know, in some ways you look at the career and say he's deserved to play for England once. But then you also look at it and actually think, when was he actually unlucky not to? Mm. Like, And it's hard to pinpoint the exact time. But you know, also, that doesn't that doesn't have to you know mean that we look back on his career with with sadness. He's been mm. a, a, a brilliant career. And he's been a brilliant cricketer, and also we do have to face the possibility that he just never gets out ever again because the last <laughs> innings of last season he made 166 not out. Yeah. So he's on about 515 runs since he was last dismissed. Yeah, and, and also it's not unusual for for, for players like Northeast to have um, a properly brilliant end of their, end of their careers. Mm. You sort of assume that someone age 34, oh, you've seen their best, but actually someone who's found a new home in uh, uh, Glamorgan and has, re- has, has done really well there. Um, that actually at 34, his best years may be in front of him. Um, but I guess, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like with James Hildreth. A lot of people say, oh, why did James Hildreth never play for England? I'm sort of like with both of them, I don't think it's that clear when they should have played 
even though they've both had brilliant careers. He's for a player as good as Northeast, he has not played much Div One cricket. It, almost the entirety of his time at Kent was when they were in Division Two. Um, and when he moved to Hampshire, that was a real opportunity. It, it, I think he must have been about in his late 20s when he moved to Hampshire. And he had one excellent year in 2019 that Ben mentioned, but otherwise didn't really kick on. Um, had he kicked on, maybe there'd have been um, an opportunity down the line. But yeah, um, good to see him do well. Um, Somerset played Kent at Canterbury and Somerset didn't pick Shoaib Bashir, despite Jack Leach being out injured. Um, we've already heard what Butch thought of it he wasn't particularly impressed Katia what did you make of that decision yeah I mean it's just kind of one of those typical kind of England county championship stories about picking a side in April where you know you don't really pick a specialist mm. spinner um it's kind of interesting that in the aftermath of those comments from Brendan McCullum saying it would be like ridiculous if mm. they're not picked that they've still gone with Jack Leach is injured and we're not going to pick Shabashir I think the rumor mill is that he's going to play the next, next fixture game, yeah. um but he wouldn't have bowled loads it's it's weird I Matt Renshaw Matt you know, Renshaw that, got the thing. He would have bowled 13 overs some yeah in the second innings and, and, and goals while he's bowling and as eight, well eight wicket sorry, sorry Matt, Matt Renshaw bowled 21 overs in this game yeah yeah which which is crazy and, and but and also you just look at it and think like what what are you what when you pick a team you don't just pick a team for the first innings and that is still true in a four-day game even though you know there's less chance for the mm. wicket to break up you know look at they're just all there's a lot of just similar bowling types in that Somerset attack and it's just a little bit of and I mean Gregory basically admits as much that you know their, their struggle is they, they you know that of all what's weird about this round actually is that although it was higher scoring I guess hmm. you still looked at games like if you had a bit more playing time we might have got a result there hmm. and this this was one of those games and actually even with the amount of playing time they had uh if if Somerset could have uh bowled out Kent in that in that third innings and that's when you might think Sher Bashir would have had a chance to to, to have an impact and also two of the four wickets in that innings fell to spin yeah and then and then Matt Parkinson obviously he we know about the action he puts on the ball but Sher Bashir is also a player who puts mm. action on his stock ball and Parkinson got a lot of turn for a wicket in that first innings you wonder just what Sher Bashir might might have done it's just yeah I mean it really annoyed me yeah when I saw the news it like it actually annoyed me mm -hmm. I think it's so close-minded how can you watch sorry but how, how can you watch him play and do so well for England over the winter I know the conditions are different but isn't he wasn't doing well because of conditions he was England's best first inning spinner on that tour um you know people like Michael Atherton I think he described him as maybe he is the one of the four that England really back in the near future um Butcher suggested that, that might be the case as well they're, Somerset are missing Jack Leach, they're missing Craig Overton. We're using a kookaburra ball that swings less. Surely, surely, surely Bashir is going to help you in this game. And I, I, I think really, counties don't help themselves sometimes. There's a closed-mindedness about county cricket. Um, and, you know, I interviewed Ravi Patel just before the India tour, um, exiting the line spinner, and he said there just should be spin bowling contracts in the same way there are fast bowling development contracts. And I think cases like this... I, I, counties need to show that they are and I, know, and I know that most counties do a pretty good job and this is a, is a one-off case but it almost I, I can see if you're the ECB and you look at this you're like well you can't trust the counties to actually look after the development of, of, of spinners so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see spin bowling contracts come in I mean there's already chat that the ECB are going to have spin bowling caps during the summer which they haven't done before as well Katia I, I guess like it's quite interesting when you look at the contrast. I know different pitches and, and Old Trafford does tend to spin more mm. than than it does at um it does down there. But um it's quite interesting to look at the contrast between Lancashire and then Somerset going in with the lineup they did and it does mm. kind of scream of we've just looked at the forecast and made a blanket decision, mm. which is not a great look in any way. N no matter if Shabashir yeah. was like England's leading spinner over the winter, it's not a good look anyway to kind of make that blanket call. Mm. Um and it is really disappointing um, when you think about, it just kind of fuels this stuff about uh, county cricket being boring in April and mm. being boring for spinners, particularly in April, when we've seen in the first round that there is actually stuff that spinners can do in April mm. and there is merit in picking spinners in April. Um, and it just feeds into that kind of negativity of 
not just kind of like the schedule, but county cricket in general. Mm. Um, and it's just kind of a bit disappointing that that happened. Yeah. If, if this was a 150, 125 shootout where all look is going to pace, I'd sort of think fair enough, but this wasn't even close to that. But, you know, but, Matt, <laughs> Matt Parkinson bowled 31 overs um, in the Somerset first innings. Uh, Lewis Goldsworthy and Matt Renshaw bowled 18 first innings overs. And then in the second Kent innings, uh, Renshaw bowled 13 more and, and Goldsworthy bowled 15. Yeah, and, and also, if it's 120 plays 150 shootout, you don't need your, your fifth right-arm seamer then. Yeah. You, know, you don't need Casey Aldridge, who's what, batting, no offence to him, and he made a 57, to be fair, and maybe and I guess that is more like almost more likely the thing, but you don't well, need Ned him Leonard bat, playing his third first-class game with not much of a record behind him as yeah. a fifth right arm seamer. Yeah, um, and, and, and especially, I mean, the, it feels like a bit of a betrayal because it's Somerset, you know, like mm. they've been yeah. talking for so long about, you know, how it's it's f- f- fine if pitches spin, as if, if you know, mm. why, why is a pitch that assists spinners different to a pitch that assists seamers? And mm. we've seen, you know, what, three recent England spinners come through their ranks. Um, but then also it's it's because that they have a team that can balance it more because you've got Lewis Gregory, who's, you know, one of the premier rounders in the county game, really, mm. uh, who just balanced that side so well and means that you just shouldn't need that the extra seamer and you never know when you might need that spinner and they they did need it and hopefully it's just you know for first game of the season uh, a bit of a lesson learned and uh, you know Gregory's what first game as full-time captain as well yeah. so hopefully that's just a bit of a lesson learned and Bashir mm. is now inked in for the uh, for the remainder yeah. until Leach returns I suppose I, I can only imagine what the chat on the Rob Key Baz McCollum <laughs> Ben Stokes what exactly <laughs> was when that lineup dropped um, anyway el- elsewhere Harry Brooks scored a 69 ball 100 for Yorkshire, um, he's probably a bit good for Div 2. Uh, back in Div 1, as Katia alluded to, there were lots of wickets to spin um, up at Old Trafford. Dan Lawrence took four wickets on his Surrey debut. It'd be interesting to see how much he bowls because he bowled a lot in that first innings. And the leg spin of Cam Steele um, took five for 25 as barely a day's play was completed in Manchester. Lancashire, by the way, are inquiring with Cricket Australia about whether or not that counts as one of Nathan Lyon's seven games. He only bowled two overs. Um, Katia, arguably the performance of the round came from Kashif Ali at Worcestershire. Very, very interesting story. Um, tell us about his, his route into the Worcestershire's first team. Yeah, so so for those who don't know, the significance of his career to date is that he's the first South Asian Cricket Academy or SACA graduate um, to sign a professional contract in England back in 2022. He was born in Pakistan, I believe raised in Luton, um, and he was part of the Kent Academy cohort that had Zach Crawley and other Ollie Robinson mm. and Jordan Cox coming through in their third and their second 11s. Um, but he wasn't awarded a contract when it came to kind of stepping up for the first team. Um, and he went around, I think, six other counties, so seven in total, like Essex, Notts, North Ants, Leicestershire, Derbyshire, mm. I think Bedfordshire in the national counties competition um, and there was nothing giving. So he decided to go to Pakistan and pursue a professional career there and did really well in in the Kashmir Premier League. And I think got quite far down the Mm. line of committing to making his career in cricket in Pakistan. And then when Saka got started and he heard about Saka, um, came back over to play a trial game for Saka and scored a rapid 50 in the first game that he played for them, batting at number nine. And then he had a really good run in the matches that Saka were playing at that point and got noticed by Worcestershire, played in the blast in 2022, made his first class debut against Derbyshire and then made his list day debut against Kent. So both teams that he trialed for Mm. and not been given professional contracts, made a century on list day debut. And then, as we said, at the weekend, he scored hundreds in both innings for Worcestershire, um, scored 110 in the first innings and 133 in the second innings. Um, And it's one of those stories that kind of it's a kind of it's a feel good story that kind of gets lost sometimes in mm. bleakness of early April cricket, um, and it shows what a difference Saka makes or has or the impact it's had for South Asian players. That someone who has been kind of cast aside by so mm. many counties has found a, a route in through Saka, um, and since then I think it's seven Saka players have signed professional contracts since he has, um, and it. Sh- uh, he thanked Saka after scoring the first 100 and gave them a lot of credit, for the re- rightly, for the reason mm. why he's there. Um, and he joins Graham Hick and Daryl Mitchell on the list of 11 Worcestershire players to score centuries in each innings of a county championship match mm. since the Second World War. Also on that list are Moeen Ali and Tom Moody. Mm. So it's a real kind of exclusive list. Yeah. 
it, do we know if anyone's ever reached 200 in the same game before with a six each time? Because I, I that, don't that's know that. Cool. No, I don't, bit, don't oh, know Either that. way, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that should have been a question that I ask you. That's true. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He's really, I remember first coming across him because I can't remember who it was. I was looking up how uh, a Pakistani player was getting on in their winter and then saw that Kashi Valley was scoring loads of runs in this competition. And by the way, Kashmir Premier League sounds like it's you know a, a tin pot tournament. It really isn't. It's actually a pretty high standard. A um, lot of, lot of in, international players play in it. And Kashi Valley was doing really, really well. And at that point, he was completely out of the English first-class system. And it's, you know, I completely agree with you in everything you said about Saka. I also think it is not a particularly positive indictment yeah. on the talent ID that exists in county cricket that a player as good as Kashi Valley required, you know, sort of almost this intervention that, that didn't exist five years ago mm-hmm. from Saka to ensure he remains in, in English uh, professional cricket. But yeah, obviously great to see him um, doing so well at Worcester. But it validates Saka's existence, if, if nothing 100%. else, right? That someone who has slipped through the net to that extent has been able to be caught by that mm. kind of Saka net and then brought back into the first class system and have a really positive story and have a good success in the in the county system. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, at Hove, Sussex came very close to forcing a result over North Hants. North Hants had a tiny lead batting second and were nine down when the game finished slightly prematurely because Sussex are not using floodlights in the championship this season for cost reasons. So um, the Telegraph was reporting that it costs £550 a day um, for Sussex to use the floodlights at Hove. Um, and counties have to make a decision prior to the start of the season whether or not they're going to use the floodlights for Red Bull games. Um, in a statement, Sussex said that they, they don't think the floodlights make that much of a difference um, in Red Bull cricket, they said the floodlights can only be used in very specific conditions where daylight is still the brightest source of light, which means they rarely extend the hours of play. I guess even if that is is true, I think it's um, obviously we had a long conversation last week about the future of county cricket. But if you've got a county who can't even literally can't afford to turn the lights on um, when, you know, Lords, for example, keeps the floodlights on most evenings if they have an event at the ground that goes on late into the night. So um, another example of the financial disparities within the county game. Um, other bit of county news, Ben, Essex might be in for a points deduction. Um, talk us through that because there's a very, very real chance that, that they incur one. Yeah, I know. When you come to the end of the round, you think, like, wow, what a huge thing that is for Essex to, uh, you know, to have been the only side to secure a win. How crucial could that become the end of the season? And then actually, they might well, once it's all shaken out, end up um, like in the bottom half of the table. Um, so the, what, what's happened is, is that at, at some point while batting, while, while Feroz Cushy was opening with, with Dean Elgar, um, the umpire just had a check of, of, of Cushy's bat and uh, deemed that it did not fall within the, uh, you know, the parameters that a bat has to mm. within the, the laws of cricket and county cricket's uh, regulations. Um, and that is enough to get a points penalty. And we've seen this happen uh, not not in the distant few, in the distant past. So mm. in 2022, Nick Maddinson was playing for Durham, um, and he mm. was found to be using an illegal bat against mm. uh, against Derbyshire, I think. And Durham were docked ten points. Um, mm. That came a few weeks later. So we probably won't know for a couple of weeks mm. uh, what Essex's penalty is. And I I don't I don't think there was much indication. I don't think it's like if your bat is you know much too wide then you get mm. a bigger points penalty i don't know what consideration they yeah they take it into i just d- don't know how this happens like uh who whose fault is it i mean presumably he's not there sticking little bits <laughs> onto his bat to uh you know to, to try and pull a fast one yeah and i guess it's just a bat maker who he'll presumably having you know a quite he, stern he call with probably i guess trusts and yeah yeah i guess so. so so in some ways you kind of feel a bit like it's a shame for essex that you know the but, but then it's also, that is just the rules. And I guess players should just be responsible for their equipment. Yeah, it, it, um, it does feel like quite a harsh potential punishment. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously we don't know for certain, but it's unlikely for it to have been a, a major misdemeanor. I'm just looking at how many how many points did Durham... Dur- they lost 10. Durham were deducted du- 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 10 points. That, that feels like a lot. Yeah. You know, that, that, yeah. that, that, that is pretty much the difference between a draw. That is more than the difference between a draw and a win nowadays, mm. now that the draw is back to... Eight points, so that that is significant. Um, two more bits of English-based news. There's good news around Joffre Archer's fitness. England have a plan. He will not be considered for Test cricket 
this year. In 2024, the focus is a white ball cricket. And it's still possible that he goes to the T20 World Cup in the early summer, which is very exciting. Um, obviously, it'd be great just to see him playing professional cricket again. But from a purely cricket performance based point of view, he would completely transform that attack. Um, elsewhere, the British government have pledged an investment of £35 million into grassroots cricket facilities and widening access to the sport within state schools. Um, funding will also help the ECB's primary and secondary schools programme to get to over 900,000 kids. Um, at the announcement, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said, I first experienced the magic of cricket watching Hampshire play at my local ground in Southampton as a child, which made me think who would have been around back then, who um, who, who, who was magical. Um, so Sunak is 43. So you're looking at the Hampshire side of the mid-90s. So Robin Smith, Sean Udall, Winston Je Benjamin and Mark Nicholas. And you can sort of imagine Mark Nicholas doing like a voiceover on a government advert, yeah. <laughs> I think. Um, but yeah, that, that is good. That is obviously really good news. Um, more details um, around that will come out in due course. Um, Katia, England's tour of New Zealand is now over. New Zealand won the final match of the series. Devine scored 100 in a straightforward run chase. What are your overall thoughts on the sort on the tour? Is it broadly positive? And are England any closer, particularly in the T Twenty um, stuff? Are they closer to knowing what their best side is? Uh, I, I think it's almost like a really odd series to analyse because on the face of it, two wins, hmm. four one in one, two one in the other, kind of looks like a broadly positive outcome. But when you dig deep into what they were hoping to learn from the series and what they've actually learn and what questions they've got ticks in their box mm. next to us and we don't need to worry about these anymore there are very few that are kind of completely satisfied for them satisfied mm. for them so going into the series we were obviously talking about the the opening debate and my view she is now leapfrogged both Beaumont and Dunkley in that debate but given that England probably will have hoped before the series that one of Beaumont or Boucher, um, Beaumont or Dunkley mm. staked that place as their own it might be a little bit more of a question mark with Boucher. Can she keep doing it in an extended mm. kind of period of form where they where they know that before Dunkley and Beaumont have done it. Mm. So it's still kind of going into the summer, looking at Boucher and thinking, right, you kind of need to kick on now so that mm. you are our opener for the T20 World Cup. Um, and also when you look at them having lost against New Zealand in one of the T20s and one of the ODIs, no disrespect to New Zealand, but this is very much a transitional New Zealand side mm. and England really shouldn't have lost against them twice in the series if they were where they wanted to be at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another kind of like amber warning sign that's on them. And then when you look at the way that they lost and the collapses that happened in both of the games they lost and in a couple of them that they won, you can say, yeah, collapse is a part of the game, collapse is going to happen. But the predictability that it's now happening for England is is quite worrying, I guess. Mm -hmm. And especially when you look at what they would have been hoping in those first three games that before the WPL lot came back, that the younger or the less experienced players were going to step in and, and really kind of make up uh, and take the step up to that kind of level. And to a large part, they didn't. They were very reliant on Heather Knight in both of those first mm. T20s to win them. Um, so that's another thing that will still be on their list going into the summer. Um, and then you also can think of um, Amy Jones had a really bad T20 series and then did really well in the ODIs. And her T20 record is pretty bad poor I think you can say with the bat for a few years now the last time she made a half century in a t20 shirt was in 2020 mm. um so that'll be on their list um it's difficult to just look at overall series wins and go yep yeah, job done when there's so much going on under the surface there are obviously positives like Boucher is a is an overwhelming positive to come out of that series uh Lauren Filer the the way they used her in the final t20 was really interesting to see um and I think you can also say Danny Gibson has kind of stepped up and mm. looks like a very good option at the death. Spinners, you, you never really need to worry about spin for England because they've got so many options. So there are positives and they did win the series, but there is still a lot bubbling under the surface that I think reflecting on the series, they would have liked to tie up rather than left as a loose end coming into the summer. I find the collapsing quite interesting because it's a very obvious thing to identify, like, oh, that team collapses a lot. And I sort of wonder, other than just players being out of nick, is there anything? Is there anything deeper than that? Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I guess. But I, I guess what you wonder with England is like beyond those, beyond the the, the senior core that we know, uh, 
like that you can just kind of bet your house on what what is their experience in like just knuckling down and getting those games at your line which sometimes you don't like it, it just breaks down differently especially in in domestic cricket when like the best players just float up to the top of the order in those really like important situations who just has done that before basically i think that can sometimes be it it's like if you've been in that situation a couple of times and you've got a team over the line especially if it's in international cricket then you kind of know a bit more how to do it i think that 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 panic can kind of just set in maybe and that's that's what it felt like to me in that game beyond just the general concerns about england beyond the, the players that we know are good um i was i was interested by the, the, the fast bowling stops because beyond sort of lauren bell it kind of looked like like nats of a brunt was maybe england's most threatening seamer which is which is which is kind of fine if she just is good enough and fit enough too but also that's was that's not a position they would have expected to find themselves in I guess yeah I, I guess they're always very reliant on spin because the spinners are so good yeah. so if you yeah. have got Nat Silverbrand as your second seamer then that doesn't always matter especially going into a T20 World Cup in Bangladesh mm-hmm. but if you look at the way that so Lauren Filer had a really difficult first like T20 debut. She conceded, she bowled two overs and conceded, I think about 23 runs off those two overs. And then coming back into the the final T20, she was used very differently. She basically tried to hit the batters and didn't take any wickets, but bowled very economically. Mm-hmm. And that set up quite a lot of other wickets. So if you look at the way she was used, if they can then follow that plan going into the summer, there's a definite role for her and her pace point of difference is quite significant mm. going into that. And then you can also think that Mahika Gore wasn't, I know she had a difficult Indian series, but Mahika Gore wasn't on this tour. You've still got Freya Kemp to come back in as well. Um, so there are other options coming through. But I, I, looking at the England squad going into this series, it was quite noticeable how light on pace options they were. Because mm-hmm. before Sibber Brunt came back from the WPL, it was Gibson, Bell and Filer were their only real three paces. So it is a valid point. Mm. Well, Boucher had a, had a very good breakout tour. Um, we're about to hear from her in a minute. Do you, do you think she's locked in for that T20 World Cup now? I mean, I thought it was quite interesting that I think it was sort of lost last summer. That she actually had a very good domestic summer and people would have seen her name in England teams for a while. Actually, she's played quite a lot for England and, and actually just hasn't even batted that often in, in a lot of the games, sort of hidden low in the order. She got an opportunity up top and really took it it was perhaps an overdue opportunity. Do, do you think she'll, she'll be opening come the T20 World Cup later in the year? Um, I think it's likely. I think, as I said earlier, I think if one of Dunkley or Beaumont had nailed down that place at the end of the series, it would have been pretty nailed on that they were going to be opening mm. in the World Cup. But I think while Boucher's penciled in, I don't think she's quite nailed on for that spot in the World Cup yet. A couple of good innings in the eight T20s that they've got before then, possibly more. I think they might be trying mm. to organise a series with Ireland. Um that a couple of good innings in there and she'll be on for the World Cup. But I think with the domestic stuff last year, Beaumont and Dunkley also had really good domestic summers. So while Dunkley wasn't necessarily doing it in an England shirt, because they had such good summers, it kind of got lost that Boat Boucher also had a really good mm. summer because there was all, they were always going to be in before her. But it does show how quickly and how little time it takes for that pecking order mm. to change. I don't think we would have said Beaumont coming back in would now be possibly fourth in the pecking order behind mm. maybe like Boucher and maybe Dunkley as well and, and Wyatt. So it does change very quickly. I think, I think she's such a natural ball striker. I think she, she looks like she has the most natural opening game for in, in T20s. I'm, I'm not sure necessarily about her short-term future in ODIs, but I think just compared to those um, competitors for that position, I think I'd, I'd really like to see her ha- have, have a long go because I know, I know obviously Beaumont's one of England's best ever batters and Dunkley's had some really good moments in, in England's shirt as well. I, I do just think that Boucher seems to have a game that is, is better suited out of the three mm-hmm. to specifically opening um in T20 cricket. Anyway, here, here is Katia's um, really interesting chat with Boucher. And coming into the series, was there much discussion with John and, and Heather and, and the others about what your role was going to be over the series? I think, um, yeah, Louis, you know, I had a chat with John and um, before the series and just to confirm where I was going to be kind of playing and you know, I've been batting at, at the top of the order and been playing for, fairly well. So 
um, I think it was only a matter of time when I just had to be patient and, and wait for that opportunity to come. And I think Louis, you know, he was very confident in putting me up top and, and seeing how I would fare. So um, after the first couple of games, you know, I've obviously, you know, played really well and, and that's just um, down to all the work that I've done. So, you know, it's um, thank you to him for, for allowing me that opportunity. Mm, I guess there was a lot of talk coming into the series about Tammy coming back and potentially it being a straight shootout um, between her and, and Dunkley for the second opening spot. Do you think you kind of flew under the radar with that discussion? Um, I don't think so. I think, you know, obviously it's very competitive, the team. You know, there's a, a lot of um, a lot of criticism, but also, you know, these are the times when we have to just take the opportunities and I think the obviously with Dunks um not probably being in the best form that she's been in but you know that's that's cricket you know it comes and goes and um and it ebbs and flows so I think with Tammy and and Dunks you know it's it's always, always a question um I don't really like to get involved with the other stuff but um I just hope that I get get up that opportunity so yeah no I think um you know that's that's a, com- a communication thing that happens just within the individually and within the coach and staff's um um discussions. So um, I just hope that I I get on the good end of the stick. <laughs> but but getting opportunities at the top of the order for England um over the last year was that almost kind of a relief that that fills or reflects the role more accurately that you've been playing in domestic cricket for the Vipers over the last couple of years? Yeah, definitely. I think you know playing. Playing at the top of the order in the at the Vipers and even at the Brave, um, that's something that um Charlotte Edwards has been really um confident with me about and and talked to me about, which has been really good. And um, I think that's just the performances that I've put in over the year, the last year, of you know, showing that I can play that role. And I think um John obviously has taken that into account and and put me up there and given me an opportunity. So um. Yeah, no, that's that's all I want to really do is is prove that I can play in that role and and really play in any role and be as flexible as I can. Um, because, you know, coming into an ODI or, you know, even an Ashes maybe, um, that that is something that I need to be able to do um and be flexible with. Mm, I guess there's almost a mirror there as well with what Sophia did a couple of years ago at the Vipers and at Brave, batting up the order and then forcing an opportunity at the top of the order for England. Yeah, no, definitely. She's um, she's done so well in that in that case. She's you know, she proved that she was really good at the top of the order, and she started lower down like I did, and she made her way up. So you know that proves how how hard she works, and you know the commitment to the team is is fantastic. So um, any chance to to show that you can do what you can and and be consistent, obviously, is really hard, but that's going to come at international cricket. So I'm glad that she's, you know, she's been able to do really well and in, in, in the 100 and, you know, at Welsh Fire, she proved how a talented she is as a player. And um, after coming off, not the best, you know, not the best season, but she's come back and done really well. So I'm just, I'm really happy for her. Mm. And I'm batting down the order in, in T20s at six or seven, as you kind of have been doing over the past few years when your opportunities have come in international cricket. It's such a specialist role. Did it feel almost like slightly frustrating that you weren't able to always show off your complete skill as a batter when you were in that role? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you kind of nailed it on the head um, a little bit. I, I knew that, you know, that role was something you had to just adapt to really quickly and you know I hadn't really played that role for Vipers or um, I, the most recent I'd played that was probably for my county but um, that come coming into the international cricket and you know learning how to adapt to that role I just had to do really quickly and um, you know the opportunity I got with England was was a good one because I was able to come in and show that I can they score quickly which is what I do really well um and you know they obviously saw that and kept me in the team which was great um and I think I was just biding my time for the for an opportunity at the top of the order um but you know being patient with that is something I've learned how to do a bit better um but you know being frustrated at playing those roles actually I think it's made me a bit more tough um coming up because um you know I've just I've had to just wait and be patient and show just 
take those opportunities when they come um and you know down that middle end of the order um that's a good time to you know you don't have a lot of time but when you do have a little bit more time that's when you can really prove um you know your worth and yeah so I think I did that and now now look where where I am it's amazing Mm, I guess a lot could change in quite a short period of time um but it feels like you've kind of been building a lot of momentum over the last year with the successful outings in the domestic tra- domestic stuff um, and then that innings against Sri Lanka at the end of the summer. Has there been much that's changed from your perspective in terms of how you've gone about it or technical changes that you've made? I think um, specifically over the win- this past winter, I had a bit more time to, to think about my game and um, talk about it with my coaches and, you know, I... I've made a, a little group of um, two coaches that I really speak to a lot. And well, one one main coach that I have at Vipers and then one here whilst I'm away. Um, but I think the main thing for me has been really being specific on a focus for my training and um, especially the mental side of things. Um, I haven't changed my technique at all. Um, I've just talked a lot about what what my options are where I'm going what my strengths are and playing to my strengths and not forgetting about them um and just really just having a focus for each training session going in knowing what I want to get out of it and and that's it really Mm. how much do you kind of think about that atmosphere down at the Vipers with it being kind of like the most successful domestic side in England has kind of helped create that kind of space where you can work on your game in that way yeah, hundred percent. I mean, Charlotte's done such a fantastic job in creating that atmosphere and that environment that you want as a professional cricketer. And you know, all the domestic cricketers and the, the domestic players who play for the Vipers. You know, you can see how much they want to work hard. They they want to improve their skills and you know talk about it as well. Because one of the hardest things is is talking about what you want to do and and understand that that's a big part of the game. Um, but I think, yeah, she's created such a, an amazing environment and to, to be able to get the best out of your players. Um, and, you know, John John is doing that as well here. It, you know, that there is that kind of overwhelming wanting to be, wanting to improve and wanting to, you know, inspire and entertain. And, and by doing that, you're just adapting to the game as much as you can. So... But yeah, I think the domestic setup has been incredible to see where it was, you know, only a couple of years ago. Um, it's amazing to see that there's been such an improvement. And obviously the Southern Vipers are doing the best and we are the best. So <laughs> bring on 2024. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are just six and a half weeks away from the end of the IPL. Um, at the time of recording, Rajasthan are going well, as are KKR and Lucknow, uh, Delhi, RCB and Mumbai are uh, all struggling. Ben, there was an interesting game between Rajasthan and RCB the other day. Virat Kohli and Joss Butler both scored hundreds, but they were very, very different hundreds. Kohli scored 113 off 72, as RCB scored 183 for three. Finisher Dinesh Kartik didn't even get a hit. Butler in the second innings hit an unbeaten 58 ball ton as the Royals chased it down with five balls to spare. I'm normally slightly wary of criticising innings where lots of runs are scored. Mm-hmm. Um, some people, sometimes people look at purely at the strike rate, and I'm like, well, look in the broader picture, you know, that was an innings that had kept the innings together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I do think that on paper, at least, this is one of the innings that is fairer to question the scoring rate, especially as they didn't lose a wicket in the first 13 overs and there was some batting that didn't even get out there. And, you know, they only scored four runs off the penultimate over, for example. Um, what, what did you make of it? Yeah, I think I think it's it's probably more the stuff towards the back end rather than in that, that opening stand. And it's, it's, I mean, it's not just that it's on papers that you could just see times when he just could have taken an aggressive option and uh, and it, and didn't choose to do that, you know. Um, I mean, to an extent, we know that this is how Coley kind of likes to play, and he has had some success with it. You know, he 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 probably values the two more than maybe any other T Twenty batter. And you know, if you do manage to score two runs for ball, I guess that is a win for the batting mm. side. That's scoring it at, at two hundred uh, off off that one ball. But if if that's what you're just looking for, and if you 
get it wrong, you either get zero or one, then that becomes actually, you know, that, that, that's how that doesn't pay off. Um, and yeah, you can just kind of see it happening. I don't, I don't know whether it's because he was getting close to a hundred or just because he thought, um, you know, we need to get through to a, what we think is a defendable total. And mm. he thought that's what, what it was. I would say as well that RCB's problems go quite a long way beyond Coley. And I guess also in their problems within how they have constructed their squad and their team, you can maybe see why he might feel he needs to take on more responsibility. Well, Maxwell's one of the other big name overseas players. He's barely got a run. Faf's yeah. not had a great um, tournament so far. And uh, as good as Karting is, um, the, the low order batting hasn't been great. So you can totally see why. That's why I don't think it's that clear cut. You can totally see why Coley is taking on that additional responsibility. Yeah, and it's just... It's just- like with with how their team is like so they they pay this astronomical fee for Cam Green on the transfer uh, from Mumbai Indians in the off season um and and so they have to play him because of how much they paid for him Faf is the captain and then Glenn Maxwell is you know he's he's Glenn Maxwell he at this point weirdly looks like maybe the most likely to move out at some point for Will Jacks maybe but that's still three overseas batters which then leaves you light on overseas bowling and they I mean this is the history of RCB is that you know they have always had loads of overseas batting talent and it's never translates to an IPL trophy. I mean, this, this is a good quiz question, actually. Do you know who RCB's second leading run scorer among Indian players is? I guess we can talk Total silence. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Rahul Dravid, uh, who, who last played for them in, in 2010. That so, is that's amazing. Yeah, that is so, so, so that, that kind of, that, this, that's the entire history of, of, of the franchise is, is them. You're going full going, Chiellini there. Yeah. It's the history, <laughs> the history of the, of the RCB, yeah. <laughs> is going for, for overseas batters and then and then relying on Cole to score a lot of runs which he often has done um and you know th- this time he got it a, a little bit wrong but this is the, the I, I think also there are times when for India as well we're actually well, it's tricky because that sometimes that that risk averse and that taking it deep has really worked like in that Pakistan game mm. Uh, in the T20 World Cup, and sometimes it's really not paid off. I mean, they've got. I a think very it is different at total. World Cups. Yes, you know, yeah. like like you know, Ben Stokes is someone who doesn't have a great recent T20 record, but was also England's most important player mm-hmm. in really crunch T20 World Cup games. Right, Play, playing quite an old school uh, way of going about it, just sort of taking innings deep, etc. Yeah, and then also the other th- <laughs> for, from an Indian point of view for the for the World Cup, Rohit Sharma has actually he's had he has kind of stuck to that fast starting thing that we saw in, in ODI cricket last year. He's scoring really quickly in IPL season for the first mm. time in quite a long time. And so actually you wonder if India have this big selection dilemma over their top six, if it might now come down to possibly Rohit and Kohli at the top um, with uh, Kohli being more of the, the bat through and, and Rohit mm. really attacking the power play. I th- uh, that's the way that I would say they might go right now, but obviously mm. still another six and a half weeks of this stuff for, mm. for people to make cases. Yeah. Um, elsewhere in India, uh, Ravi Shastri has been busy on Twitter <laughs> today. Uh, part of what I hope is a promotional campaign, Shastri has posted several photos of himself in a dressing gown with captions such as, does this count as a thirst trap? And I am hottie, I am naughty. Um, it's not just the, the batting talent factory that India excels in, it's the promotional ad campaigns with cricketers too what was what was the Kapil Dev one it was kidnapped yeah they, they stage a kidnap of Kapil Dev and they just sort of put a video of that on social media and sort of people sort of hoped it was a fake and um, well everyone just kind of assumed it was to ignore it <laughs> and, which left the possibility that, that it wasn't and he was just you know it's like the, the, the boy who cried wolf I hope the Shastri thing isn't an ad campaign by the way I think <laughs> that'd be like sure if it's an ad campaign, fine okay we can move on with our lives if it's not it's great. And also just, just imagine it all in, in Shastri's voice, you know, the, the, the tracer bullet voice uh, is, uh, is, is, is amazing. Oh, excellent. One of, the, one of the great figures in the world game. Uh, <laughs> RG asks, do, um, do any of you feel confident enough to go out in London wearing a watch and or a ring? Um, excellent question. This is in response to uh, Kevin Peterson's bizarre tweet yesterday where he said that he was going to London for the day because he's um, wary, he basically he said he was he he didn't think it was safe in London to wear a watch or a ring. Um, Peterson is obviously prone to tweeting some some bizarre things, but I thought this was this was another level for, from for Peterson. You know, full, full out conspiracy nonsense. Um, yeah, which I, I know that he's prone to, but this is probably the most explicit example 
Yeah, well, if, if if we're analysing it, then then, then yeah, it was uh, <laughs> it was weird. I mean, I mean, you know, Ravi Shastri's so worried about getting stuff sold, he doesn't wear anything anymore. So it's... <laughs> if you want an update on how safe it is in London, I'm wearing three rings on my fingers today, and I still have them on my fingers. I have not been mugged, so it is yeah fine to wear rings in London if that's the route we're going down on this podcast. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm neither a watch nor ring wearer, but rest assured, I'm I'm not. Um, I'm not on KP side on this one. And actually, um, if if you want a, a story about Londoners being nice, I I just dropped my passport uh, <laughs> like last summer, and someone I think I think he's a bus driver, but he wasn't it didn't drop it on his bus. He just found it and he just picked it up and uh, sent it to the dress in the back, you know, all of oh, his wow. own back, and I, and I and I got it back. So actually. Uh, from from my experience, you can basically just drop whatever you like, and you'll and you'll, you'll kind of get it sent back to you. I've had several stories about you losing your passport now. Yeah, we don't need to get into it. <laughs> um, anyway, that is everything uh, for today's show. Thanks, Katia. Thanks, Ben. We'll be back next week for the launch of the 2024 Wisdom Almanac.